this past Tuesday, the Singapore Parliament passed a law requiring virtual assets mm. service providers to be licensed if they want to do business overseas. So it's an attempt by the Monetary Authority of Singapore to ensure that it has uh, adequate supervisory oversight over uh, crypto and other uh, service providers brings oversight to those firms to make sure that there's no money laundering, et cetera, counterterrorism, financing, all of those sorts of issues. Joining us now to give us more insight on this new law and what impact it might have is Angie Lau, the founder and editor-in-chief of Forecast News, a former Bloomberg journalist uh, for many years, a good friend. Angie, great to have you back on the show. Absolutely. Hi, Glenn. Hi, Neil. Uh, so tell us about this law. Many jurisdictions now are looking more closely at crypto, NFTs, anything that is happening in the digital currency space. Um, how important are these new laws in Singapore? Will they have much impact on the, on the uh, trading space? I think it already has. Uh, Singapore in 2021 was, was very welcoming in its language. Uh, open arms, it appeared from uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore saying that Crypto should not be clamped down. And in less than a year, uh, I would say that the the, the chill has arrived uh, to the crypto business community there in Singapore. There are about 100 applications uh, that are in front of the MAS right now for, uh, for uh, ability and license to do uh, crypto exchange and crypto business in Singapore. Only three have been approved, and we've we've seen sort of a migration, possibly an exodus, uh, of many crypto firms heading out of Singapore and mm -hmm. uh, into other jurisdictions. Um, is so there listen. is there a logical uh, place that they're going to? I've I've heard about Dubai. Uh, you you talked about the digital in the desert, uh, crypto in the desert. Is there another place that is the obvious winner uh, at the moment? I don't think anything's obvious right now um, because mm -hmm. where Singapore once seemed to be the obvious winner because it was so welcoming and there was really a, a recognition that Singapore is one of the gold standards when it comes to financial regulations in the world, that if it were to be the leading jurisdiction to think about how to regulate crypto in, in a holistic way, that that would be very informative for the rest of the world. I, I don't doubt that Singapore still has the ability to do so, uh, but it is uh, walking forward with uh, a little bit of trepidation, um, especially since its latest moves. Look, I don't disagree with, with this latest move. Uh, it is about reputational risk of Singapore. And uh, very specifically concerned that there is this halo around any crypto business that is set up in Singapore and then uh, communicating that to a crypto global community that may or may not even know how to look up on an MAS site, whether or not it has a license or doesn't have a license. And so Singapore is doing the right thing in the global community in terms of protecting its own reputational risk. However, mm. however, based on based on some of the communications and the moves and the the uh, uh, lack of speed uh, and welcoming um, for for some of these applications, I think that that has created concerns about operational risk for business. Uh, and there's this, you know, Glenn and Neil, there, I don't know how much people perceive of crypto. You know, there is still very much this perception that, oh, it's really scary and terrorist financing and, and all the rest. Uh, that, is a, that is a very uh, pervasive narrative and one that's not necessarily right. And one that jurisdictionally it's convenient to trot out uh, without being thoughtful and intellectual mm. about the regulatory space. And, and I think there is really an opportunity for Singapore to instead of saying, you know what, let's not do marketing for retail investors 
and and you know coming uh you know coming to the the regulatory space through enforcement as we've seen yeah. in the US with the SEC but if 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 that at the end of the day is the goal then take the time to uh really be thoughtful about exactly how to create a jurisdiction mm -hmm. a, a regulatory environment in which retail investors can feel really safe um okay. and that that is that is a journey right now for singapore that that is truly fascinating what you're saying there angie because i'm, I'm hearing two spheres here almost two silos on the one hand you've got the business silo let's not discourage investment and a degree of speculation in this country but on the other hand and this is why the government perhaps introduced the law into parliament on tuesday you've got the public silo when there's off, often a lack of um, awareness uh, a lack of education on things like cryptocurrency which is also why singapore has discouraged companies in the cryptocurrency space from advertising their services in public which you might suggest would be contradictory because if they're not advertising then there's a lack of awareness so as i understand it the singapore government is trying to walk this fine line between encouraging investment but at the same time making sure that the public are not having the wall pulled over their eyes mm. so where do we find that line because it seems to be a very thin one angie it's it's got to be a courageous one and it's got to be a one of conviction a political conviction but you know there's a lot of political headwinds obviously for singapore uh in this uh, current geopolitical environment there's a lot of pressure and uh, Singapore has this reputation of gold standard regulatory in Asia. Uh, and if you take a look around the region, there is no doubt. I mean, there's 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 a very clear there is a very clear reason why forecast born in 2018 uh, is now one of the the most prominent, dare I say, uh, uh, it sounds like news you are saying it. <laughs> news organizations, thanks You're to our allowed. readers who also who also you know give us that credo. Um, but but we're the only ones who have that perspective from Asia, right? Mm. That's the story that we are seeing very clearly from mm. Asia. Asia is part of this crypto global story. You cannot mm. ignore that, and and so when we do our reporting in singapore and in hong kong and thailand indonesia korea etc india etc etc singapore has a very critical role to play in right. that southeast asia is a a you know a, an enormous opportunity for where crypto innovation is already flourishing and right. so, so just to follow up, Angie, of, sorry to jump yeah. in there, but just to follow up. So how do we change the perception and should we change the perception? Because I just threw a question out on Facebook. Should crypto be licensed, controlled in Singapore? And Mike, one of our listeners has chipped in and said, yes, especially money launderers from China. And that's exactly what we're talking about with perception. When you say right or wrong, but when you say crypto to certain people, you hear money laundering, you hear money washing and so on and so on. So how do we change that perception or should we? Well, so first of all, the technology is so specific that you um, are very clear on where that money originated, every hand that it passes. Um, you've heard of uh, a lot of these crypto hacks uh, and, and the inability of these hackers to actually, you know, get away with money because they're all tracked down. It's all on blockchain. And so mm -hmm. this is where we are today with uh, KYC and AML. This is where the industry is today. Um, that's very clear. The industry is very clear that uh, the regulatory space must be part of the crypto growth story. And one of the most incredible things about crypto is that it actually allows the average person to participate in the global economy in a uh, in a one to one way um, than ever before. Uh, it is it is transforming. It is allowing wealth generation in parts of the world that had had zero access to that. Uh, take a look at uh, rural parts of India 
take a look at what's happening in Africa. This is now access to um, finance mm. uh, that was not uh, available before. Banking so, the unbanked, as it were, right? Correct, correct, yeah. correct. Yeah. So this perception does does exist, but there's there's a system that is also trying to figure out, and I'm talking about the traditional and the legacy system of finance, that also sees a lot of benefits and sees concerns that it is going to replace and transplant itself into the daily lives of people. And I think therein is the bigger issue. Yeah, we're speaking with Angie Lau, the founder and editor-in-chief of Forecast News. And if you are, if you are not up to speed, or if you are up to speed on blockchain, on crypto, on NFTs, if you want to learn more about that, I strongly suggest you go to forecast, F-O-R-K-A-S-T dot news. Uh, that is her website, and they cover all of these issues at, you know, very, very well. And um, I'm, I'm, as you can tell, I'm a fan as well, Angie, um, because you are talking about it in a way that um, doesn't talk down to people, but really gives people the understanding of what's happening um, in this ecosystem. And and as we look around the ecosystem, uh, look, people often confuse blockchain with crypto, with NFTs, with all, and they conflate them all into one big, I don't know what's going on, and so I just put my mm -hmm. head in the sand. Yeah. And I think it's really important that people understand that this is, these things are not to be feared, but they are here and they are not going away. And the future, in fact, will rely much more on these uh, than I think many people realize. Um, as you are, as you are now in, uh, what your second year with Fort Forecast? Is it? Is it We're two years? We're going into now? our fourth year now. Fourth year, excuse me. Yes. Um, are Are you seeing that there that there is somewhat more understanding coming coming forward or is it just because is it because every time something new comes up um like a new nft that people are just even more confused do, do you find that there is some some better amount of information that's reaching people we're trying to do our part we're trying to do yeah, our part and right. uh yeah. it is it is a very it is th this space uh, was was very lean in terms of information, um, right. even just a couple of years ago. And I'm really thrilled to see more and more of our peers uh, get into the space. Uh, and, uh, you know, once upon a time, it really just did feel like a, 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 the few of us who had was starting forecast was working on this. We are now a team of 50 with some of the best um, journalists, uh, and you'll know them by name in the world and i'm so thrilled to have world-class journalists uh mm. sit on the team and lead this coverage and it is exactly for that reason is because more and more people are just so hungry to understand beyond why prices are going up and down and really is the only narrative around here uh this is this is really scary and i should you know just try to stick my head in the sand and it's for drug dealers i mean there are a lot of very strong narratives that persist, uh, but they're getting really old and they're getting really, really tired because- And debunked the the as day, well, right? Yeah. Absolutely debunked. Uh, and um, look, Singapore itself, uh, Tomasic uh, and, and other sovereign uh, uh, investment uh, vehicles are all in and have led rounds of some of the top crypto firms in the world. Uh, including the top crypto exchanges in the world, including FTX uh, and the like. So, uh, you know, you have to ask yourself, okay, if the Singaporean government is looking to invest the, its, the, the capital of its people, of mm -hmm. its country's future in crypto, why can't it be good enough for its retail investors? And should there be, should there be, more effort in helping people understand why uh, and creating those opportunities for businesses. Uh, and, and to be clear, that's what Singapore is doing, um, but with, with some recent moves um, mm -hmm. and, and recent legislation, I think the message is being sent that um, there could be operational risk uh, mm -hmm. remaining in Singapore 
and Dubai is getting a lot of uh, of these crypto firms, including Singapore based firms that are heading to Dubai to set up either regional head offices or head off main head offices. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the, the audience the smart, smart people also recognize it can't just be that one headline. Um, right. Let's let's look around for smarter coverage. And there's 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 a lot of smart coverage out there, and I'm proud to say that that our team has broken exclusives uh, out of Asia. Uh, we have a very specific Asia perspective, and we think the Asia story uh, is part of the crypto story. Very yeah. and, uh, Angie, if I could just jump in because we did have another reader's comment that I wanted to get to, and uh, Sheila said it would be prudent to do so you know, to uh, organize, legislate, to do so, particularly if there is a high probability that crypto will be used to hide assets or used for criminal activities. So there's that comment again. We are up against the clock. So, Angie, apart from reading Forecast News, we recommend all our listeners to go to Forecast News. What would be the one takeaway you would give to the, skept the crypto skeptic? Think of, uh, here's what I would say. Uh, jump in and start exploring for yourself. And, and I would say stop outsourcing um, to these, these narratives and really explore the, the story beyond. Um, that, is a, that is a very popular narrative. And, and to be sure, um, when money is involved, crime is involved. Uh, but do we blame the Singapore dollar for the crime? Do we blame the U.S. dollar uh, to be instigators of the, the crime? KYC and AML is happening uh, right now in crypto. That That is very clear. What it actually is, is the speed of the transactions and the ability for people to engage peer-to-peer -peer without a third party. So think about that. It is disintermediating legacy institutions. That's why... That's why this is a very powerful story and and one that uh, is very challenging for a lot of uh, governments and institutions right now to try to figure out how it could coexist with the system that we have. And I, I do mm. believe so. I do believe so. But we all have to be really intellectually honest about these conversations. So do your research, do your homework. Don't don't just rely on narratives that have been put out there already. I think that's great advice. And go to forecast news. And go to forecast <laughs> you news. You guys, thank Angie you. Lau, founder and editor in chief of Forecast News, F O R K A S T dot news. Uh, Angie, if you wouldn't mind sticking around on our Facebook. Um, live page for money fm and answer any other questions put in links if you have links for information that would be great we'd appreciate if you do that for us sounds great yeah in the meantime thanks for being with us hope to have you on again will do